for number one. While they are, while you're turning there this morning, um, I was looking through my phone and um, something popped up in my memories and on my, my timeline today. But it was a year ago tonight that we were um, at the Magnolia Springs Fire Department after Hurricane Sally and uh, had the, the big outreach in, in our community. I alluded to that Sunday night. Uh, but uh, there's no telling the lives that were impacted uh, that night, that afternoon. And uh, I've, uh, I've been proud of my church a lot of times over the past 12 plus years, being here full time and years before that, um, coming on Wednesday nights when I was in college. But uh, I don't know that I've ever been any prouder of a church during that time when God uh, used us mightily to impact our community, those that are hurting around us, uh, alluded to it Sunday night with great opposition. Oftentimes comes great opportunity. And, uh, you know, I thank God for using us uh, in that way. And uh, you know, this time last year, it was a very difficult time for us, but God brought us through and opened up many doors for us. And uh, I thank him for all that he has done and is doing in us. We want you to be in prayer for Brother Eddie. They're closing out the camp meeting in Michigan tomorrow night. We'll be flying home on Friday. Uh, I want us to be praying. Uh, I know he's mentioned several times, but uh, when he gets back home next week, he's going to have the pins taken out of his foot and uh, then uh, has an appointment with the surgeon, I believe, on the 30th. And so um, I'm, I'm praying God to heal him uh, before he gets to that point. I believe he can. I know that we prayed many times before, and but I want us the next week to get under an even greater burden than what we've had and uh, lift our pastor up to the Lord and, uh, and, and pray for God to heal his body. Well, and I have to talk about it. He's been in pretty bad pain. His wife over there from Deborah tore it on him, and he's in pretty bad pain today with it. So, yeah. so uh, we'll have special prayer for him tonight when we uh, get into the altars that the Lord would... Uh, Touch him and do a work that only he can do. Acts chapter number one, very familiar passage, verse number eight. I mean, you don't even need to turn to, to quote this verse. We quoted it, we preached from it many times before. But the word of God reads, Acts 1 8, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. I want to preach of the Lord to help us tonight on the purpose of Pentecost. The purpose of Pentecost, if you will, stretch forth your hands this way. And ask God to help us and anoint us tonight. Father, we love you. We are so thankful for your spirit that we've been made to feel. Father, I thank you for the testimonies of the saints tonight. How you're moving, how you're working, how you're uh, changing and transforming lives. And God, we're, we're so thankful and we rejoice for all that you're doing in your body. We thank you for it tonight, Lord. We thank you for the, the reading of the word of God. We As the, the light has fallen for the preaching of the word, I'm asking now for the unction, the anointing, the empowerment of the Holy Ghost to rest upon me tonight. Father, I need your hand. I need your touch. I need your anointing greater than I've ever needed it before. Lord, have your own way. I pray that you would use the preaching of the word tonight as you anoint us, Lord, anoint us to, re to receive and to respond to the word of God tonight. Do a work in our hearts and in our lives that only you can do. I pray that you would challenge your church tonight. Challenge us, Lord, to draw closer unto you in this late hour in which we live. Father, in the final uh, moments of this dispensation of grace, Father, I pray that this be the church's greatest. God, and you would use us mightily in a way that only you can. And we'll be careful to give you the glory, the honor, and the praise for all that you're going to do. In Jesus' name that we pray. And the church says amen and amen. The purpose of Pentecost, I, I observe and I study and, and look at um, 
the church and, and much of Christendom today. And I believe that there are many dangerous trends that are um, in, engrossing much of the church world today on one spectrum of the, uh, the, the dangerous scale that I see is you have one camp that is all fluff and no substance. And then on the other side of the spectrum, you have those that are dead at 3 o'clock in the morning. And might as well be cessationalist that uh, the, the gifts and the workings of the Spirit of God are, are non-existent in their uh, ranks and in their, their services anymore. And those two camps couldn't be more diabolically opposed to each other in practice or in doctrinal thinking. Uh, you have many that I'm afraid in the church has missed the true purpose of their existence. And they have missed the purpose of their experience. Listen, I, I, I am all for Signs, wonders, emotions, tears, shouting, running, speaking in tongues. I'm, I'm all for the emotions of Pentecost, and I believe we ought to get emotional every once in a while. Right. Say amen. amen. I used to say, I shout at the drop of a hat, and I'll drop the hat if you let me. And then I believe in, uh, in uh, the, the exuberance of worship and in the exuberance of hot, fiery preaching. I believe in uh, all of the, the gifts, all of the emotions of the Spirit of God. I like what one preacher says, that if you can have Him and not feel Him, then you can lose Him and not know it. If you can have Him and not feel Him, then you can lose Him and not know it. So I believe that uh, when we have uh, uh, good Pentecostal worship services where, where we're able to feel God's presence and we're able to feel God's glory. But I also know that deep down in my heart that the purpose of the Spirit of God goes much deeper than my emotions. The purpose of the Holy goes much, de goes much deeper than what I can feel because there's been many times in my Christian experience that... Uh, that I have not been able to feel him as strong as at other times. There's been some times where I have felt like David to where I'm walking through the valley of the shadow of death and I'm thinking, God, where are you at? Listen, there's times where we've got to walk by faith and not by sight. There's times where we've got to walk by faith and not by feeling. There's going to be times when your feelings can lead you astray. When man's emotions get into it, uh, and get into the equation, many men are oftentimes uh, led astray. So we've got to realize that the working of the Spirit of God, uh, yes, it may invoke your emotions, uh, but the working of the Spirit of God goes much deeper than man's emotions. Uh, we can never get to the point uh, to where the focal point of our experience becomes the byproducts of the Spirit of God. We never can get to the point to where uh, all that we do is focus on the ancillary things, on the, the gifts. We need to focus uh, on the gift giver. We need to put our focus on the baptizer. We need to put our focus uh, not on the acts of the Holy Ghost. Uh, we need to put our focus on uh, the Holy Ghost. Uh, and if He wants to shout us, then we'll shout. If He wants to run us, then we'll run. If He wants to break us uh, and we sit for three hours in a holy awe uh, at the, uh, and being awestruck at the presence of God, uh, amen, let the church, uh, let the Holy Ghost have His way. Hallelujah. Whatever He desires to do, uh, amen, let's let Him lead God uh, and direct us in all that we do. Uh, but as a church uh, and as the church, uh, we should go back to the Bible to find our purpose and ask ourselves, uh, what is the purpose? purpose of the Holy Ghost. We put a lot of emphasis on being filled with the Spirit, but very few ask the question, why am I to be filled with the Spirit? Amen. We, we believe and thank God that I'm a part of a church that preaches. Uh, amen. Pentecostal doctrine. Uh, and and um, what we do is doctrinal and what we do is according to the Word of God. Uh, but many tonight preach, uh, you should be filled. Uh, you've got to be filled. Uh, but they never explain why you need to be filled. 
They never explain, uh, amen, why uh, you need the power and the presence of God. And they never explain uh, uh, exegetically the, the purpose uh, of the Spirit of God. I believe that uh, when we find in Scripture, I believe that we can find four uh, direct purposes uh, of the moving and the infilling of the Spirit of God. Uh, and it would do us all uh, well as we're walking this Christian walk to ask ourselves, uh, are we fulfilling our purpose? Do we have the Holy Ghost uh, just to get emotional? Do we have the Holy Ghost just to speak in tongues? Uh, do we have the Holy Ghost just for signs uh, and for wonders? Uh, or are we filling our biblical purpose uh, of being vessels full uh, of the power of God uh, and operating in the power of uh, the Holy Ghost? Uh, I believe when we find in Scripture the first purpose of Pentecost uh, was to empower the church. For the church to be empowered for any animate object to be effective in their role, there has to be a power source. Has to be a power source. There must be something equipping and empowering that object for service. For humans, the Bible tells us that the light of the flesh is in the blood. It, there has to be uh, something fueling our body, and we know that is the blood. Uh, for plants, uh, it's oxygen. For electronics, it's electricity. If you were to take blood out of humans, we would be dead on impact. Immediately. There can be no life outside of the blood. You take oxygen away from a plant and store it of oxygen, it's going to turn brown, it's going to wither, and it's going to die. You take electricity out of an electronic, out of a television, out of a radio, out of what whatever it is electronically, then that object is going to die. Amen. As we look in the spiritual, the Holy Ghost is the power source for the church. The Holy Ghost is God's chosen method of empowerment. And for the church to be effective, we must have the power of the Holy Ghost operating in our lives and through our lives. Amen. While there are many things that modern Christendom has averted to in this hour, the Holy Ghost is God's chosen method for empowering His church. If we use anything else to empower us, then we are missing the mark. It's a sham. It's a shame and it's a farce. Amen. For the church to be effective biblically and scripturally and spiritually, it takes the Holy Ghost to empower the church. It takes the Holy Ghost. There's nothing more or nothing less that is sufficient for that church to be operational in this present world. If it took the Holy Ghost for the church in Acts chapter number 2, it's going to take the Holy Ghost in 2022. Amen. We may evolve uh, as a society. Uh, amen. We may change as a society, uh, but we must never change scripturally. Uh, and we must never lose uh, our power source, uh, which is the Holy Ghost of heaven. The Holy Ghost is our power source. Look at Acts 24, 49. Behold. Pay attention. Let me grab your attention. Behold. I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. He gave them the command, I'm going to send the promise. And I like what he said, go into the city and tarry until. Sometimes it may take more than three minutes of prayer and tarrying before the Lord. To receive the promise of the Father. They didn't know how long they were going to have to tarry in Jerusalem. It wound up being 10 days. That they spent in prayer. In supplication and fasting for the Lord. But when they tarried. It was then that they received. The power from on high. The Holy Ghost. Is the means. Of church empowerment. There may be nuggets of wisdom. For pastors. For laity for leadership in church growth books and church growth seminars and in, in church growth resources. But I can tell you if that's all that you're basing your church's growth on is man's view and man's viewpoint, then I can tell you you're missing God's view and God's viewpoint. The key to a vibrant, healthy church always has been 
and always will be the Holy Ghost. Yes. Yes. Amen. He is the difference maker between being animate, having life, and being inanimate and having no life. Never measure. The Lord spoke to this to my heart this afternoon. Never measure how healthy a church is by its attendance, by its talents, or its programs. But you measure how healthy a church is by the effective working of the Spirit of God. Listen, I have been blessed as God has opened doors to travel not only a lot around the U.S., but around the world. I was in Salt Lake City, Utah uh, some time ago, I guess, uh, January, February of the first part of this year. And my hotel was literally right across the street from the big Mormon tabernacle and the big Mormon uh, square. You'll never find a more beautiful building anywhere in the world than you will looking at that thing. Beautiful, brother. The, 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 the structure, the outside, the inside, absolutely gorgeous. But can I tell you, you'd be hard pressed to find a more dead building anywhere in the world. In man's eyes, if you were to take most conservative Pentecostal holiness churches and you would put it up against that, the world would choose that 100% of the time. They're enamored by the beauty. But listen, I wouldn't trade a, one of those for, uh, or uh, one Bible way for a thousand of those. Why? Because the power of the Holy Ghost makes the difference. Being able to come into a building, amen, that may be able to seat about 200 as opposed to 20,000 or ever how many that tabernacle seats. Uh, amen. I, I would rather be able to walk in the doors and feel the presence of God uh, and know that this is a place where the Holy Ghost moves uh, and the Holy Ghost is in operation. Uh, I would rather be in this environment uh, than in the greatest cathedral. Uh, amen. Jesus said it uh, of the Pharisees that they were white and sepulchers full uh, of dead men's bones. Uh, that's what a lot of religious entities are uh, in America in the world today. Uh, they're beautiful on the outside. They're beautiful on the inside, but they're void of the power of God. Oh, and they're missing their eternal purpose. Sure, they can draw a crowd. Sure, people want to flock to it to look in their beauty, but nobody's truly getting born again. Nobody's getting delivered. I mean, their city is not being changed. I mean, by its effective witness, as a matter of fact, it's getting worse. There's more homeless people in Salt Lake City than there has ever been in the, the city's existence suicide and drug rates are through the roof why is it amen because it's full of religiosity but it's lacking in the power of the Holy Ghost listen our effectiveness is not our beautiful buildings it's not our programs it's not our money it's not our wealth but the church's existence and its effectiveness must be measured is the Holy Ghost in operation is the spirit of God there our lives being changed and transformed by the power of the Holy Ghost. That is how you measure the effectiveness of that church. Now that's no excuse to be satisfied with 30, 40, 50 people in the building. We've got to get a burden for souls. We've got to get a burden for God to do more. But it matters not if we run 2,000 here. I mean, if there's no presence of God, then we've missed the mark. Amen. If we run 20,000, amen, but the Holy Ghost, amen, is grieved and is no longer in operation. Oh, God help us. Amen. We must be effective. Amen. We must be filled and allow the Holy Ghost to have His will and His way in our hearts and in our lives and in our churches. There is no substitute for Holy Ghost power. None. He is the only biblical source of power for the church. It was found in Acts 4 verse 33 and with great power it gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and great grace was upon them all. What was the means for their great power? 
Simple. That's in Acts chapter number 4. The source of that great power fell in Acts chapter number 2. It was the Holy Ghost that empowered the believer. If a church is to reach its God-given potential, it must be baptized with the power of the Holy Ghost. I've got to go through these quickly tonight. No way that I can take time and, and just spend on one and exhaust it. But number one and two, not only did God come to empower the church, He came to embolden the church. To give the church boldness. In Acts chapter number two, we've, we read... Uh, we all know Acts 2 verses 1 through 4. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. It filled all the house where they were sitting there, appeared unto them cloven tongues. Like as a fire sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and spake with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave the utterance. One chapter. What a great four verses. You see the infilling of the church with Holy Ghost power. But the Bible doesn't stop with Acts 2 verse 4. As a matter of fact, that chapter didn't even stop with Acts 2 verse 4. If the purpose of the Holy Ghost coming was for the church to feel the wind, to feel the fire, and to speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave the utterance, then I believe you can stop the Bible right there. Job well done. We don't need to go any further. But the Word of God continues. There's still a plan and a purpose. And what is that purpose? For the church to be emboldened with power. Immediately after the Holy Ghost fell in verse number 4, now we're all filled. Now we see the reason for the filling of the Holy Ghost. Now we see the reason for the power source. There were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded. Listen, when the Holy Ghost falls and He comes in purity and He comes in power, you're not going to be able to contain it in the four walls of your church. Amen. It took no. They didn't have Facebook. They didn't have Twitter. Uh, they didn't have um, social media. They didn't have TV, radio. They didn't even have uh, Morse code to get a message back and forth. They might have had a few carrier pigeons. We don't know. But the means and the resources for getting a message out was very limited. But immediately after the Holy Ghost fell, it was noised abroad yes. that God come to Jerusalem. That the Holy Ghost fell. And the multitude came together and was confounded because they heard every man speak in his own language. They were all amazed and marveled. Said, oh, not all these that speak Galileans, but we hear them speak in our own language. And Parthians and Medes, the Elamites, dwellers in Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia. You can read on and on. They were all amazed and were in doubt, saying to another, what meaneth this? Confused. And then... We get down to the crust of the matter. And others begin mocking. Others begin their persecution immediately. Saying these men are full of new wine. These men are nothing more than a bunch of drunks. Up there in the, the upper room. Putting on a magic show. Or they're, they're caught up in some kind of odd foul spirit. They're, 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 they're drunk. So we see the infilling of the power of God. We see immediately confusion as what's going on. And then we see persecution that's coming their way. If there was anybody that should have folded like a deck of cards, it was Peter. 53 days before, this man denied Jesus three times. When the rubber, meets down, the rubber gets down to the road, a man that was lived his life with no conviction. A man that saw the miracles of Christ, who, who saw Christ do amazing things, even brought the dead back to life when he was put on a public trial by two individuals, two commoners and a little damsel. He denied and he swore with an oath and he said, I don't even know this man named Jesus. That's Peter's track record. That's Peter's history. 
And on this day, he receives the gift, the promise of the Father. He receives the gift of the Holy Ghost. And that same persecution that he experienced 53 days before is now resurfacing again. If history is an indicator, Peter should have cut bait right then and run. If, if history is an indicator of how someone is going to act in the future, then Peter was no candidate to receive this gift. But you see, this gift made all the difference. This gift, amen, made all the difference in his life. For when persecution come and said, these men are drunk, amen, these men are out of their minds, amen, who was it that stood up? It was Peter who stood up with the eleven and said, sirs, listen unto me. These men are not drunk with wine as ye suppose. Amen, seen it is, but the third hour of the day is just nine o'clock in the morning. But this is that which was prophesied by the prophet Joel. And he began preaching the gospel. He begins expounding unto them the scriptures. He begins operating under the gift of the Holy Ghost. He begins moving under the influence of the Spirit of God. And just a few short chapters later, 3,000 men and women had been born again and birthed into the kingdom of God. Revival came to that city and that town. How did it happen? It happened because that church was not only empowered, but that church was emboldened to stay and to proclaim the works of God. That, my friend, is why the Holy Ghost is so important. He'll take a backward, shy person that might have a history and a track record of being wishy-washy in and out and lacking the boldness to stand. But you get them full of the Holy Ghost and they'll stand flat-footed and preach to the same crowd that they did not into 53 days before. And then they'll cry out, Brand and brethren, what must we do to be saved? What is the difference? The difference is the Holy Ghost. Yes. The emboldenment of the Spirit of God. Peter was a coward 53 days prior. But he was a mighty man of God preaching with conviction. 53 days later. It was the same man. But the difference was the power source. The difference was the Holy Ghost that was on him. You see, before, the Holy Ghost moved upon him. But now the Holy Ghost dwelt in him. Oh, hallelujah. It was like the prophet Jeremiah of fire shut up in his bones. Acts 4, verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And what happened? They spake the word of God with boldness. Boldness. You can say, preacher, I don't, I, I'm not good public speaking. I'm not good with testifying. I'm not good in front of people. Neither am I. I was always the class clown, the funny one, the comedian. But you put me in front of the center of the room in a room in front of people. If I wasn't doing something stupid to take the attention off of me, I was wilting like a leaf. You don't know what all of that foolishness was? It was a front. It was a front. I'd have saved myself a whole lot of trouble in my teenage years if I would realized that then and dealt with the root of the problem. I don't like talking in front of people. The older I get, the more introverted I get. When I first started working my job, we had to do those personality tests. And uh, we were doing that for team, for communication and team building. And uh, on one particular one, they were amazed at how even keel I was. I was about 50% on several of the different levels. I took it again about two months ago. It went from 50-50 introvert to extrovert to 99% introvert. 1% extrovert. Something's happening in my old years. My, I guess my true nature is starting to come out a little bit. Don't know. I don't like being in front of people. Amen, but I, I know what Jeremiah said. Yeah. Hey Amen. There's times, Brother Bob, where I'd just be content sitting on the pew being quiet. It is like a fire shut up in my bones. Amen. The power of the Holy Ghost 
that talks. Amen. That emboldens us for power. Amen. You may be shy. You may be backwards. Uh, amen. Just get under the spout when the glory is coming out. Uh, amen. Get full of this Holy Ghost and power. Uh, amen. And boldness will be a problem. Uh, because while you lack boldness, uh, the Holy Ghost will give you boldness. Yeah. Hallelujah. Where you lack huh, in your personal giftings huh, and you feel inadequate, huh, that's why you need the Holy Ghost huh, because He'll build up areas, huh, amen, that you lack huh, and He'll build you up in your most holy faith, huh, amen, and talking in front of people. Huh, I don't like it at all, huh, but let me talk about Jesus a little bit, huh, amen, and it don't bother me a bit. Huh, oh, hallelujah. Amen. Thank God huh, for Holy Ghost empowerment huh, and thank God for Holy Ghost emboldenment huh, that emboldens the church to proclaim the word of God listen you don't have to fear man principality or power when you have the Holy Ghost in operation in your life amen you may not be the best public speaker amen when you stand before God he's not going to grade you on how articulate your speech was amen when you stand before God he's not going to give you a grade on how well you on how well your syllables flow together if he did this message in and of itself would disqualify me oh Oh, hallelujah. But it's not about your education. It's not about your articulation. It's about letting the Holy Ghost have His will and His way in your life and letting the gospel loose. It was Charles Spurgeon that said the gospel is like a lion. Just let it loose and He'll defend Himself. We just need more men and women to let the lion loose. Amen. To let the Holy Ghost have His way. Hallelujah. And you'll see the difference that He makes in our lives. Now, I'm not making light of education and knowledge. I believe it's important to study the Word of God. I'm not putting a premium on ignorance. But we must never get to the point where we put more faith in our education than we do the Holy Ghost. That's right. Hallelujah. It takes Him and Him alone. Third, the purpose of Pentecost was and is to emanate through the church. To empower the church to embolden the church, and to emanate through the church. That word emanate means to flow out, to issue, or to proceed. It is the will of God for you to be filled with the Spirit. Why? So the Holy Ghost can flow in, through, and out of your being. It is important that there is an inflow of Holy Ghost power. But it's just as important that there be an outflow yes. of Holy Ghost power. Right now on the map in Israel, there is a body of water that looks beautiful. But it is incapable of containing life. We know it as the Dead Sea. And the reason the Dead Sea is dead is because there's tributaries and water sources that flow in to that body. But there is no channel through which water can flow out. And so what you have is a cesspool of sediment. And what you have is an environment that is incapable of containing or producing life. There's no fish. Very little vegetation on the outside. And none on the inside. It teaches us a lesson. That as much as we need an inflow of Pentecost, there has to be an outflow of Pentecost. Listen, we are not called to be reservoirs. To where we just store up the gifts and the blessings of God. We're not called to be reservoirs. We're called to be conduits. Amen. We're called to be channels through which the Holy Ghost flows. Amen. There will be no life in the believer. If there's no outflow the same way that there's no life in the Dead Sea tonight. Uh, amen. As much as we need to pray for a fresh infilling, uh, we need to pray, Lord, uh, give us opportunities for there to be an outflowing. Uh, God, give us opportunities where as you pour into us, uh, we can pour out uh, into a lost and dying world. Uh, oh, hallelujah. There's got to be, uh, amen, uh, a life source uh, that flows in us, through us, and out uh, of our lives. Look at the biblical pattern. Uh, they were filled in Acts chapter number 2, verse 4. Uh, but the Word of God and the Word works of the Spirit of God did not stop in Acts 2-4. As a matter of fact, that's just the beginning. 
That's just the launching point. Amen. I can tell you Holy Ghost infilling is not the end of the road in your spiritual journey. Receiving this gift and the Spirit of the, the, the Holy Ghost of God is not what we say is over with and I'm done. Honey, that's just the starting point. When you get filled with the Spirit of God, I mean, you're just now entering into the thrust, amen, of this thing that He would have for you. In Acts 2.4, they were filled. But in Acts 2.14, Peter was preaching. Peter was declaring the works of God with power and 3,000 people were saved. In Acts chapter number 3, Peter and John, we alluded to it earlier, go into the, the uh, temple at the hour of prayer. See a lame man sitting there by the temple gate, been lame for years and for years. He looked on him expecting to receive something from them. They said, silver and gold, have I none? But I do have something for you. I do have something for you. The money and silver and gold can't buy. Amen. But I have something that's far greater. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. In the authority, in the stead of Jesus Christ, I'm here. Amen. I am his conduit. I am, hallelujah, the channel. Amen. Just a little while ago, I was in an upper room and I was filled with the Spirit of God. And here's an opportunity to put into, amen, experiment. Here's a chance that I have to display that power source in the name of Jesus Christ. Rise up and walk. And immediately his ankle bones received their strength. And he stood walking and leaping, praising God, uh, entering into the temple. Uh, listen, it was just as if Jesus Christ uh, had laid his hand on that man's head. Uh, amen. And he received his strength. Uh, amen. That's what being filled with the power of God uh, is all about. Uh, when we pray in the name of Jesus, uh, we're acting on his behalf, uh, in his authority, and in his stead. Uh, and he has given us the power, uh, amen, to conduct kingdom business uh, if we just allow him uh, to emanate, to flow through us I thought many times brother Bob Jesus had to pass by that temple many times could it have been that that lame man that sat there daily by the temple gate Jesus looked at him had compassion on him and desired to heal him but he said I'm just going to hold off just a little bit hallelujah I'm going to leave one for my Holy Ghost filled disciples. I'm going to leave one for Peter and John. Buddy, you don't know what I know. Hang on just a little bit longer. Peter and John, full of the Holy Ghost, full of power. They put into operation what they have received. I mean, you want to know why we don't see what they saw in the, old, in the, in the New Testament? Because very few in this hour put into operation what they received. I'm not talking about the cares wackos out there. Amen. I'm talking about the, the true blue Holy Ghost. We can talk about that crowd all day long. But what are you doing with what you've been given? What am I? It's easy to put a bullseye on a target on that crowd. It's easy to pull the bullseye on a target on the MacArthur crowd and the cessationalists saying that the gifts are gone. That's easy to preach against that. But what are we doing with what we've been given? It's a whole lot different story when we put the mirror right in front of us and we took a hard look at us and our life. What are we doing with what we've received? What was the difference between the New Testament church and much of Christendom today? Brother Bob, they put into operation what they had been given. They realized they weren't called to be reservoirs, but they were called to be channels and conduits through which the Holy Ghost could move. Amen. Their desire was not to build Big, immaculate buildings. And I'm not against having a beautiful church. I think the church ought to be the most beautiful building around. But what if we put our faith in the building and not put our faith in what goes on in the building, we've missed the mark. We have a mausoleum. Amen. We have something incapable of producing life. Oh, as a matter of fact, the church, uh, the New Testament church, their focus was not on buildings. They sold all that they had. Men had all things common. And their main purpose was expanding the kingdom of God. Was sending missionaries out. Oh, God help us tonight. The Holy Ghost comes for empowerment. The Holy Ghost comes for uh, emboldenment. The Holy Ghost comes to emanate through us. And lastly, I've got to hurry. Amen.
The Holy Ghost comes for mobilization. Now that is a military term that means to organize and to prepare for active service. The United States military, looking to Brother Chris, he can preach this a whole lot better than I can. Thank you for your service, brother. But before they ever step foot on foreign soil, there's been a mobilization process for weeks, sometimes months before. I remember my brother going into Iraq one of the first troops through to go get Saddam. <laughs> Never forget, we were all worried about uh, the military operation underway in Iraq. And when I finally got to talk to my brother, I said, yeah, we were glued to the TV watching as everything was happening in live time. He just laughed. He said, you thought you were watching in live time. Hey, man, it's tape delayed. He said they had been over on the ground for quite some time before it had ever leaked out to the American press. I said, well, that's good to know. Amen. So what you think is, is live, often case, it's, it's not. But before they ever got to that point to go into enemy territory, there was a mobilization process that took weeks, that took months to get everything ready. Amen. And it was then, once everything was ready, they received the orders. Click your heels, it's time to march. It's time to go. Amen. It's time to, to receive your orders. Listen, that's what the Holy Ghost is for the church. We were mobilized on the day of Pentecost. Yes. Amen. We were given the power source. Amen. And our text tonight was our marching orders. And Acts chapter number 1 verse 8. You shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me both unto Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the world. Everywhere you go, you're to be a representation of what you've received. As you have received this life, freely you have received, freely give. Why is it, Brother Bible, go to the secret of places around the world, sending in articles that could cost him his life because he received his marching orders in Acts chapter 1 verse 8. Why does our pastor go to the Congo where he's facing a firing squad with bullets shooting at him? We've been mobilized and commissioned in Acts chapter 1 verse 8. Why is it that we support through missions the gospel throughout all the four corners of the world out of this church right here? We've been mobilized. We've been given marching orders. Amen. To be witnesses both in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria to the uttermost parts of the earth. Listen, that's why we have received Holy Ghost baptism. That's why we've received the Spirit of God. I believe in shouting. I believe in dancing. I believe in running. Amen. I can't stress that enough. I believe in the emotionalism that comes. Thank God I'm Pentecostal. Amen. I couldn't be Presbyterian. Couldn't do it. I couldn't be Baptist. I couldn't be Lutheran. I've got Lutheran friends. I've got Baptist friends. Nothing against them. Amen. I just could not. Set through a Methodist church one time. I was lost as a goose in a hailstorm. But I thought to myself, dear God, I can't sit through this again. Amen. I looked at the brochure that they gave. The procession takes place at 10 o'clock at 9.59. Here come the altar boys. They had it down to the second of how long every song was going to last. They had it down to the minute of how long the preacher's sermon was going to last. They'd fire me if I tried to get up behind the pulpit. I can't preach in 26 minutes. Taylor told me the other night, people's attention spans only 14 minutes. Your sermon should only be 14. I said, dear God, I can't read my text in 14 minutes. <laughs> Couldn't do it. They told us we're going to be getting out of the church service at 11.15. I looked at my watch at 11.14 and 58 seconds. I'm walking out the front doors. I can't handle that. You know what that is? That's death. It's no wonder they're ordaining homosexuals. It's no wonder all the tomfoolery is going on. There's no life there. Amen. The purpose of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Thank God for all the motion. But it's for life, folks. 
It's to be empowered with a power source from on high. It's to be emboldened in our witness. It's so that the Holy Ghost can emanate through us and we can be conduits through which the Holy Ghost flows. And it's so we can be mobilized for active duty. It was Paul that told Timothy, he said, now therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, a militaristic term. Listen, we're not called to be couch potatoes. We're not called to sit on the sidelines, but you and I are active duty. Amen. Sometimes we get assignments, Brother Bob, the special forces. We go on the devil's territory. We go behind enemy lines. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. We're being mobilized by the Holy Ghost in this present hour. Amen. He's given you the Holy Ghost for a purpose. You need to know what that purpose is. And you need to spend the rest of your life fulfilling that purpose every day of your life. Purpose of Pentecost. It's been an amateur attempt at best. Cursed and I'm done. Through, come help me. But there's nothing more sad in life than watching individuals meander through life and never know their purpose. And it's even sadder to see many Christians in the exact same boat. They never realize their purpose. And many, thank God, I don't think I'm preaching to anybody in the church tonight. I'm preaching to somebody on live stream. You're watching, thank you, this is for you. But many have the gift of the Holy Ghost. Thank God for it. But they do nothing with the gift that they've received. And that's why it's important to not be filled with with the Holy Ghost but to be full of the Holy Ghost there's a difference in being filled I'm done and being full when you say I've been filled with the Holy Ghost that could have been 55 years ago it's not enough to just be filled that denotes a moment in time that you receive the gift of God are you full tonight are you running over and I'll take it one step further if you have received this glorious gift, what are you doing with it? What are we doing with it? Listen, God never gives a gift without an internal purpose in mind. You and I are going to give an account for what we do but with the gifts of God. And we're going to give an account for what we don't do with the gifts of God. Listen, tonight, maybe you're here and you've been filled with the Holy Ghost. 55 years. Thank God. Let's walk in our purpose. I'm not talking down to anybody tonight. This message is as much for me as it is for you. Amen. We have a purpose. And we must fulfill that purpose. We have an obligation. To whom much is given, much is going to be required. Amen. Every gift has an eternal purpose. Amen. I encourage you. Amen. To, to walk out that purpose. If you hear and you've not been filled. Amen. See God for the purpose of the gift. Amen. See God. Lord, don't just seek the baptism. Seek the baptizer. Seek the Holy Ghost in His fullness. Amen. Lord, you're looking for a conduit and a channel. Here's one right here. Lord, you're looking for someone to empower and embolden with your presence. Lord, I'll open my mouth and I'll speak. Lord, you're looking for somebody to mobilize and to go and to see, and here I am, Lord. Listen, if you're willing to fulfill the purpose of the Holy Ghost, then you are a candidate to be filled. No questions, no ifs, ands, or buts about it. If you're born again, and you're willing to fulfill the purpose of the Spirit of God, every devil in hell will tell you the Holy Ghost is not for you. But I can tell you, every voice in heaven will scream out tonight, that he is for you. And if God be for you, then who can be against you? The purpose of Pentecost is as plain and as doctrinal a message, as simple of a message as you'll hear on Pentecost. But I can tell you if we'll take hold of it tonight. Oh, amen. The same way the early church turned their world upside down for the kingdom of God, we can turn our world, amen, upside down. If we were to turn this world upside down, then it would finally be right side up. Amen. As much ungodliness as is going on in this day and age, 
Let the church be the church. Let us find our purpose. Amen. And let us fulfill, amen, our purpose. Will you join me in the altar tonight? Amen. If you've been filled, pray to God to get refilled. Leave this house tonight full of the Holy Ghost and power. If you haven't been filled, there's no night like tonight. Amen. Say, Lord, you've got a purpose for Pentecost. You've got a purpose in my life for the working of the Spirit of God. I'm willing to be empowered. I'm willing to be emboldened. I'm willing to have you emanate through me. I'm willing to mobilize. Oh, God. And I'm willing, God, to be a troop, an ambassador for Christ. Use me, Lord, for your glory. Find us a place to pray tonight.